Mirtami Mansari, thank you ever so much for uh, coming on the show to talk Afghanistan. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, now, let's. I'm going to cast your mind back all the way back to Afghanistan. Okay. You left Afghanistan in the late 60s, right? Actually, the early 60s. 64 is when I came here. Yeah, the early 60s. Now, yeah. tell me about, you know, Kabul of your childhood. And Mirthami Mansari in Kabul, you were growing up. How was your childhood like? Well, I, I had uh, three phases in the childhood. So the first part was in Kabul. And it wasn't in Kabul. It was in the Ansari network of compounds. You know, I was a, I was a kid. <laughs> mm. So we we lived in uh, Kabul in a neighborhood called uh, Deburi. And then we had the village of Dio, which was about 10 miles outside of Kabul. A lot of Ansaris lived there. And that was my childhood. Then when I was about, I guess, eight or nine, my father was uh, appointed um, uh, to a high post in the Helmand Valley Project. Mm. And they were the ones that were administering American money to build a uh, irrigation network and, you know, develop a huge development project in southwestern Afghanistan. So then we moved to a town, the town of Lashkargo. I'm sure you know. Yes, I've been I'm there. I've been about. there myself. I'll, 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 I'll okay. tell you a bit later. Yeah, I've been there myself. And 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 when you were there, I'm sure Lashkargo was very different from when I was there. Mm. Uh, you know, when I was there, the town had been just built two two years earlier, I think, and so it was like ten or twelve square blocks, and it came to an abrupt end. And then from there, you looked around, and all you saw was desert, um, paved the straight the lines. River. You know, wide streets. Wide streets, straight lines, and no compound walls. And, um, you know, uh, we were there for six years, and half the town were, were Afghan officials uh, that were working on the project, and half the town were American aid workers and engineers and stuff that were also working on the project. So at that point, my life was divided between Americans and Afghans, you know, and mm -hmm. I went to the uh, Afghan school there, uh, but the school was something they had built overnight in Lashkar. You know, it's like yeah. And uh, and in that uh, Afghan school, um, the the government, in when I was in Lashkar, the government had just decided they were going to try to tackle this Chaudhary business. You know, the Chaudhary yeah. they call it the Burka out here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Daoud uh, decided to. Um, you know, um, uh, you might know about this history, history but uh, Daoud uh, claimed that he couldn't find the part of the Quran or Hadith that uh, yeah. specified what the Chaudhary should look like. And he gathered the uh, uh, Maulanas to point it out to him, and they couldn't find it either because it's not there. And then he just said, oh, well, then the, the government's, the royal family is not going to do that anymore. Yeah, and they appeared uh, with bare faces, the women of the royal family, at the next Jeshan uh, festival of independence. But in Lashkarga, the government wanted the high officials to carry out the policy. So in that uh, Lashkarga school, they had the the daughter of one official mm -hmm. entered the school that was all boys, and that daughter, or that official, was my father. And the one girl who entered that school was my sister, Rebecca. So she was the first girl to be in a classroom with boys. That was a Canada. brave, brave thing to do. <laughs> well, I, I think it was much more tense for the adults who knew what the stakes were than it was for us kids. You know, it's like I was probably uh, uh, 10 at the time or something. My sister was probably 12 or 13. I don't know what the ages were, but we were down, down like that. And of course, she didn't. She didn't wear a chaudhary, but she had gloves and, you know, mm. uh, uh, a long black skirt and tights. Her face was bare was the only thing. But anyway, that was when it started, you know. And then we moved back to Kabul and there was a government of evil. And then I got a, a scholarship to a boarding school here in America. And so I came and my mother came at that point, too. And so did my, uh, my sister got into a college and we all left except for my father. And he came a year later to the embassy in D.C., but uh, one year later, they shut down his job. He was the press attaché, and uh, he had to decide whether he was going to go back or stay here. 
And I think the choice was if he stayed here, he was never going back. And he decided to go back. And so he went back. And basically, I only saw him a couple more times after that. So that was the end of the nuclear family. But by then, I was like a 16-year-old, 17-year-old guy. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm an adult now, you know, mm-hmm. just on my own. Um, so that was it. Uh, for 12 years, I there was no there were no Afghans in America then. You know, there was a few people in in DC, and um, but I was in Portland or you know other mm. places where I went to school. So uh, I never ran into another American except when I went to Washington DC to visit my mom, and there would be some other Afghans around. Uh, and then. Uh, you know, and then it was the 70s and I started to think, well, maybe I should go back and, you know, mm. check it out. But then the government fell. Who happened? Mm. Uh, Daoud kicked out the king. My father said, you should wait a couple of, um, you know, let, hold off. Let's see what this is all about. Yeah. And actually, I just found a letter he wrote that was in my files that he had, um, you know, you couldn't, as you probably know, well, I guess you don't know, you know, back, this was before <laughs> your birth, I guess. <laughs> you know, things got very, very dangerous and, and all that later. But back when Afghanistan was peaceful and, you know, it was the 60s and 70s and it was the golden age of democracy and all that, it was still a place where it was very dangerous to say things. Yeah, so I mean, it, I never it was, had a, you know, when you talk about, when you, when you talk about, uh, People often talk about that period in, you know, with a sense of nostalgia and romanticism, that yeah. it was a period where the golden age of democracy, Afghanistan was a safe place, but the regime was incredibly brutal. Yeah. And and it, the, the country was incredibly unequal. Uh, it was oppressive, dangerous place outside Kabul. Now, your parents or your father i suppose uh, was a well you came from a well connected family i suppose yeah uh we did although you know my father my grandfather was a well connected person <laughs> yeah we'll get on to that we'll get I, I, i'd like to hear about your grandmother more than that yeah my my grandfather was a well connected person and he was good friends with uh, the fellow who was the treasurer for habibullah Yes. But when Amonullah came, that treasurer, you know, there was a, he hung that treasurer outside this palace, you know. He, Ouch. Yeah, Habibullah was assassinated. And there is some reason to believe that Amonullah plotted to assassinate his father. Mm-hmm. And as soon as he was assassinated, and apparently the treasurer had written Habibullah a letter saying, I think there's a plot to kill you and it might be your son. So... Amonullah brought that guy in and said, um, you know, did you write this letter? And I think you killed my father. And the guy said, well, you think (laughs) I killed your father? I think you killed your father. Let's have a trial. And uh, Amonullah said, no, actually, I'm the king. I get to do what I want. Hang this guy. So they hung him and he was gone. Uh, And uh, my grandmother was um, uh, somebody that had been given to my grandfather as a little kid when he toured Hazorajot mm-hmm. with uh, with this treasurer, and they were looking to see what kind of tax base there might be there after the devastation of the Abdurrahman wars there. Yeah. And uh, uh, so as soon as my grandfather died, the other uh, uh, wives in the village, I you know, I'm piecing together what the yeah, story yeah. might have been, but I think they closed up, the, you know, she had to uh, leave. And my uh, she and her five sons i think you know in the circumstances of the time if you're a uh, woman and you have five children and they're all sons mm. <laughs> you're, you're kind of lucky actually absolutely yeah <laughs> and, you know so she moved to the city and um, she went to the um, the family of that uh, treasure and they took her in mm. and um, uh, but she was you know she was kind of like a servant yeah. And my father, I remember he was, uh, he used to tell me, look, when I was a kid, I had to go out and collect uh, dried uh, cow dung yeah. and bring it home because we needed something to uh, burn 
stay warm in the winter. So he was a poor guy. You know, those five sons came from came from and, and Jack Poverty. Actually. Can you delve into, you know, your grandmother's story a bit more? Now, do, yeah, do, well, have you have you managed to find out which part of Hazarajat, uh, you know, what was the circumstances of, you know, she was given to your grandfather? I, I know you, you, you write about her in the book, uh, Games Without Rules, but if yeah. you could spell it out a bit, as, as the Brits would say, the story. I think everything I know about it, I put in my earlier book, West of Kabul, East of New York, and I don't know much because, you know, I've heard that she was from Uruzgan, mm -hmm. wherever that is. I think that's at the edge of Hazara Jot or something. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not sure. Um, and that's as much as I know, you know, and uh, and I heard that when he brought her back, uh, he lived in Kabul, you know, he he parked her in the village. He said, here's somebody, and she was just part of the uh, the people in the village that uh, were his people. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what the story was with, the, with <laughs> how things were in the village then. Yeah. Uh, and that part of that part of my family, that all happened around 1900. So that's a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, and I think, uh, you know, A, all the people that I knew didn't know much. They were mm -hmm. like, this was like um, just stories from the, uh, uh, you know, they were floating around in the, uh, in the family network of stories. And by the time that, that I, uh was you know came into being and was old enough to have consciousness of my family circumstances um my grandmother we called her cuckoo mm -hmm. she was like this revered saint like figure yeah uh and uh you know her five sons all achieved mightily <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and i think i do know from the children of the the third uncle you know the, the yeah when they came to Kabul one of their sons went to work and he was probably you know he was probably a upper level teenager he might have been 18 or 19 I guess mm -hmm. um I don't know how old they were but one of them went to work uh one of them went into the army the oldest one went into yeah. the army uh then the other three went to school you know so one of my uncles uh, who became kind of the patriarch. He went to the new government secular schools that they had just started to uh, have. And he graduated from there and he was sent to America and went to Tufts University and he came back and he had gotten a, a degree in dentistry and one in, uh, and one in political science or something. And- uh, Quite smart, I'll, quite I'll smart. You, uh -huh. Quite smart. I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this story because um, uh, it's not in Games Without Rules, but it is in West of Kabul. You know, he, he came back and, and he opened a dental clinic and uh, the royal family would not make appointments. They arrived whenever they wanted and they wanted to be seen right away, no matter who had appointments ahead of him. And he was not in a position to say no. Yeah. But what he wasn't in a position to do was say, I don't think I'm going to be a dentist. So he shut down his office <laughs> and all the government had paid to have him go to school was kind of wasted. Yeah. Uh, so then they said, well, you can be an advisor to uh, the Ministry of Education. And so he pulled a salary, but he basically never left the compound anymore. He would go to international conferences once in a while. But basically, he was just this intellectual that stayed at home and people came and asked him his opinions about stuff. So now, that was one uncle. <laughs> now, your, your, your parents, sorry, your father being... You know, ethnic division has been a big thing in Afghanistan for many decades now. Yeah. Um, and of course, the, the Hazaras went through, you know, the Hazaras history of in Afghanistan has been one of immense pain, you know, which oh, carries yeah. on up to today. Yes. Uh, it is, it's kind of a never ending wound after the, you know, what Abdul Rahman did. But yeah. given your, you know, your parents, your father is being half Hazara and how that impact his sense of identity as to, you know, who he was. And of course, you've inherited some of the features. So how how that make you feel? Uh, 
I have a I have a soft spot for, <laughs> for Hazaras and Hazarajat, you know. Yeah. Uh, I am I am I can when I was growing up in in uh, in Kabul when I was a little kid, mm. I would hear Hazaras being uh, uh, jokes being told about Hazaras within the family, you know, yeah. within the, uh, the uh, they were sort of like Polish jokes here. Mm -hmm. uh, that you know the ethnic uh, humor that represented somebody as dumb and mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, a comic thing was and then this this Hazara did this or that. Um, so the fact that our grandmother was Hazara was something that's very obvious when I see pictures. Mm -hmm. but the family didn't talk about it. it. That was not. She wasn't Hazara. She was Cuckoo. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And when my when my mother married my father and came back to Afghanistan with him, that was a huge thing, believe me. So your mother was an American uh, woman. Yeah, she was a uh, the daughter of of Finnish immigrants living in Chicago. So you know she was like a working class immigrant poor person from, from a family yeah. like that. Here, she married this uh, this guy from the poorest country on earth. But yep. in his country, he was kind of like a high upper class. Yes, he wasn't upper class because we 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 knew we were not mm. uh, we were not Pashtuns, we were not uh, royal family. You know, we weren't Mohammed Zais. They were the upper class. We were yep. we were commoners. Uh, but we were. I realize now we weren't just any old commoners because mm. we had uh, poets and saints in our ancestry so from the <laughs> yeah so from the most islamic point of view we had something you know um when my mother came she has very poignant moving things to say mm. about coming to the house and this little woman this little wizened wrinkled little woman mm. came to greet her and that was kuku yeah and kuku took her in to the family and kind of placed her on a pedestal and said mm -hmm. she's the guest. Yeah. Uh, and my mother feels that if Coco had not received her the way she had, she would have had difficulties. And we think perhaps, you know, I, I can only surmise that um, Coco no, knew what it was like to be the stranger coming in. Yeah, that's very strong. That's a very strong thing to say. You know, and my mother remembers, my father was, she and my father came in together and Coco went to um, my father and she she put her arms out like this and it was as if water was pouring and then she put it on her head like this. Mm. And my mother said, what is she doing? And my father said, that, that that gesture meant she was taking all the troubles he had seen and bathing herself with it and saying, I'm taking your troubles on me. Now, Mr. Um, Amit, you, you, your first... She was an amazing woman. Um, no, that's incredible. Your, your, your initial encounter with America, I mean, you, you had encounters with Americans. Your mother was an American. You went to Lashkagar, you 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 met Americans there, you pay, your, your father worked with them. But when you first, you know, the reason I'm asking this is because for a lot of people in that the diaspora, you know, has got so big. Um, yeah. You know, your experience will be handy for many of them. But, you know, how did you find a culture, a country that was, you know, alien to you i mean what was the sense of disorientation confusion was it there or you 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 found it easy no i haven't found it easy ever really to tell you the truth or you know i do i'm very i'm okay now mm. i think the first 40 years of my life i was my experience was when i walked into a room no matter who was in that room there had been a lively conversation before I got there, but then everybody got awkward and silent because the, the guy who isn't one of us had entered. And I didn't feel that in the family in Afghanistan, mm. you know. 
but I did feel it outside the family if I was in just the, you know, public Afghanistan, other Afghans. They saw me and they knew that's that American guy. And there was no others when I was little, you know, it's like yeah. there was, my mother was the first one that came from America. So I was sort of a little blondy looking kind of guy. Now you may know that blondes are not, um, they're not common in, in Afghanistan, but there are blonde yeah. Afghans, you know, they come from Panjshir and Nuristan has a, from yeah, yeah, all the yeah. way back to, but I was, I was a known person, you know, mm. and, uh, I, one time the king came to Lashkarga and it was a huge, you know, oh, the king. And there was a big public event. And the king said, that guy there, bring him up here. And they had me come up on stage. And he said, so you're the uh, son of, uh, uh, you know, the American woman. Tell me, boy, are you an Afghan or are you an American? And I said, I'm half and half. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I was lectured i was yanked off the stage and i was told you shouldn't say you can must never say that you're you, you're, you're an, an afghan. afghan you're not don't bring up that so that's that was my experience when i was in afghanistan um, in afghanistan i was the american guy but then when i came here i was the afghan guy you know and in school, they called me the Mad Afghan. That was my name. The Mad Afghan. What? <laughs> what had you done? What had you done? Uh, but you know, I think I've I, I ended up fitting in here for one reason, hmm. uh, because uh, I think the culture of Afghanistan is such that it's communal. Yeah. So your identity has is merged with that of the family, and you have an identity in there that is part of you very much to your very core. And I wasn't, I didn't have that. I was the guy who was different. Being the, the different guy was the essence of who I was. Yeah. So that meant I was alone. I was just, a, I was unique amongst everybody that existed. That's That was my sense. Here in America, individualism, the individual is the ultimate unit. And yes. everything is built around the idea that, yeah, you got to guard the individual. Don't, you know, mm -hmm. don't make the individual be anything but what he or she is. They got So in that sense, I fit into the culture of total individualism better than I did in the culture of communalism. Um, so I was able finally to kind of build an identity here. But there was a conversation that came up in a couple of days ago where somebody said yeah yeah there's different cultures but it's always me you know i go to ohio i'm still me and i'm like no my experience has in my life been i'm not the same guy you know it's weird when i went back to Kabul in 2002 after 38 years of being away my 4c was was not good you know mm. i could barely speak I land in Kabul and I start walking around and hey, I can speak 4C again. <laughs> Where did that come from? That, that's home. That's home. <laughs> and I'm I don't think I'm the same guy. You know, it's like it doesn't feel like I'm the same guy. But the last time I went to Avon Stone was in 2012. Mm. And when I came back, I said, Okay, I think I'm done now. I'm not going back. At that point, it was just because it's such a long voyage and I'm old. <laughs> You know, no, you're I not. can't sit on a plane. Uh, that what long. has what has you know that what what has that you know that 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 sense of estrangeness, I suppose. Um, you know how how does that how could you sum sum it up in terms of what has it done to your to you emotionally? The strangeness, the the being the stranger. Yeah. Uh, you know. I think it's given me a certain kind of resilience for one thing, mm. but I think it's also given me uh, kind of an intellectual first principle mm -hmm. that that everything I think always comes back to this first principle, which is it's all relative. You know, yeah. I am a guy who thinks. Absolute truth isn't possible for any individual to know. You mm -hmm. know. So that's 
that's not to say I don't think there is an actual final absolute truth, mm. but I don't think it's knowable by any human. But uh, do do so you whenever... feel? But do you feel there is a a piece of you still you know wandering somewhere in Afghanistan? You've left something there that is. Yeah, I do. I do. And how does that feel? Um, that part is is one part is it's one part love. You know, mm -hmm. there is a love there. Yeah, I love where I came from and who I came from. Mm. And there is a lostness too. You know, it's like there is a. Uh, I wouldn't say this isn't nostalgia. This is a, a sorrow. Yeah. Uh, that you know, there is a severed. It's not. It's not a sense of being severed from my roots. Yeah. It's a sense of not actually connecting to my roots. You know. But so does it? Does it? Does it hurt? Yeah, it hurts. Um, it hurts. Uh, there is a part of me knowing that, you know, that I'll, I'll never, I'm, I'm dead certain I'll never, I shouldn't say dead certain, I just said there's no <laughs> such thing, but, <laughs> but I will say I'm fairly, I'm, you know, I live in the certainty that I'm never going to see Afghanistan again. Mm. Uh, and, um, and, and that's a sad thing, you know, that makes me feel sad. Mm. Um, and uh, it makes me care that Afghanistan is in trouble, mm -hmm. you know, in a way that I kind of don't care that, say, Burma is in trouble. I think Burma is in trouble, too. Lots of places in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> there is a difference in how I feel about that being the, being the case re-Afghanistan. Um, so, so there's that. Uh, I think, you know, when I went back in, the last time in 2012, and at that point, the American project in Afghanistan was in full swing, you know, it was like mm. in Kabul, it was totally happening, and, you know, everybody was busy trying to get what they could from mm -hmm. yes. the American project, mm -hmm. uh, which I think American observers were looking at that and saying, what is wrong with these people? They're just grabbing the money. And, <laughs> you know, and my feeling is there in Afghanistan, it's like the certainty is it's here now and who knows what tomorrow is going to be. I got to yeah. get what I can right now. Yeah. That's not at all an attitude that didn't make sense. Come on. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I worried then. What's going to happen to this place? Because uh, on the one hand, it was so full bore, full charge. There was a whole demographic age group that mm -hmm. was born or came of age within the American project and had staked their lives on this is going to last. This is real. We can plan our forward life based on how yes. it's going. And man, it looked to me like this ain't going to last. Mm. There's, um, you know, so so I was, but then I was kind of like, well, what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> now you know, you you were growing up in America, maturing, and quietly yeah. going on about your business. Then nine eleven yeah. happens. Yeah. So then you wrote that letter. So you yeah. know, tell me about that letter. Um. You know, that letter happened, you, you know, um, if you're in a room and a bright flashbulb goes off in your in your eyes and then for a moment you can't see, mm -hmm. it felt like that moment, you know, um, uh, that event, 9-11, was such a, a brutal, you know, <laughs> it sort of yeah. blew up on all of our faces and, and, and when when I could see again, the letter was already out there. I must have written it when I was unconscious. <laughs> you know, it almost <laughs> felt like that. And before that letter, um, 
I was a guy who was unable to speak in public because I was so shy. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, my, my brother-in-law died, his funeral happened, the memorial service, and people got up and said things. And I couldn't get up in that in that assembly and say a few words because I was too tongue-tied mm -hmm. and shy. And all of a sudden, that email was out there, and people were like just bashing on my door and saying, come and tell us all about Afghanistan. And uh, and I found myself just in all these public venues talking to hundreds of people. There was no sense of being unable to speak in public. You know, it was like mm -hmm. I was. It was like I was not the guy I had ever been. You were thrust so onto the again, limelight suddenly. What? You yeah. were thrust onto the limelight suddenly. Yes, and and the sense was the thing that had been. Uh, you know, the, um, you know, the basic experience of my identity was this two cultures thing. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was on a wall and there was a culture on this side and a culture on this side. And I, I could see both of them, but I couldn't be part of either one. And so for that few, for a few years after 9-11, it was like the thing that I had been wrestling with all my life and trying to figure out was the thing that was relevant to the public global conversation right now mm -hmm. it was necessary for me to try to tell really the american side what the afghan side was about because i was articulate in english and i wasn't in 4c so that's what i did i told you know i used what i had built up all these years i could speak english and i could write english mm -hmm. so uh so now, I for, used... for for our listeners who don't know about that letter now you know tell us about the circumstances of writing that letter and also what did you, you know, what was the main argument in that letter, the thesis of that letter? The thesis of that letter was everybody, my experience was that everybody was outraged and the outrage was directed at Afghans. Mm -hmm. And everybody somehow, you know, right from the moment the bang went off, they said, Afghans did this. We got to go get those Afghans. They'll, we'll make them sorry they did this to us. And so my letter was, and, and the phrase that, that jumped out at me in the talk show that I was listening to while I was riding around in my car mm -hmm. was bomb Afghanistan back to the Stone Age. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, my letter basically said, you don't, don't you realize Afghanistan has been bombed back to the Stone Age and that it's been suffering for 20 years here? Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, the things that the Soviets did were, uh, crimes against humanity that I think still haven't been reckoned with. Mm -hmm. And the Soviets are now gone. So there's no one to reckon. You know, it's like there's no one to there's no one to answer for those crimes. So that's kind of been forgotten in a way. And I'm I don't like that that's been forgotten. Um, but what I was saying then was the Taliban were involved in this, sure. They're not Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, they're uh, uh, you know, they're kind of like this thing, this outgrowth, this horrible outgrowth that happened because of what was going on in Afghanistan. So that's kind of what I was saying. And then I was also saying, uh, you guys think you can just go and bomb it and then it'll be over. That's not going to happen. Before mm. you know it, you'll have troops there. Once you have troops there, Pakistan is going to get involved. Then there's going to be this world war and there's 2.5 billion Muslims or whatever the number is. Mm. And you want to be at war with that because I think bin Laden does want that war. That's mm -hmm. what this is all about. That's why he did this. And don't fall into this trap. Don't start a war. That's what I that's what I wanted to say, and I think I did say in that letter. Different people have interpreted it all different ways. You know, I was once introduced by somebody who gave and they said, yes, yeah, Mr. Ansari wrote a letter right after 9-11, and he called on the U.S. to go into Afghanistan with troops and save the women of Afghanistan. And I'm like, no, that's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't um, you read the letter? <laughs> now, th there was, you know, what was, did you go to America around the same time as Ashraf Ghani and Zulmay Khalilzad did, or? Uh, Are you c contemporaries? I think those guys are a little younger than I am. <laughs> I think they came a, a little bit later than me. Uh -huh. um, but I'm not I'm not sure. I, I know uh, 
uh, Mo Kayumi, you know, was, there were three guys, Kayumi, Ashraf Ghani, and this, uh, uh, what's his name? Well, remind me, I'm, I'm blanking. What's the third guy? It's Zalmai <laughs> Khalilzad. Yeah, Zalmai Khalilzad. So those guys were all roommates at the at, uh, University of Beirut. And I think my cousin uh, Farid was there with them. Uh, you know, uh, he knew them from Beirut days. So, yeah, they, uh, uh, you know, I was aware of them before. Mm -hmm. So you knew them uh, before, you know, all that, before they became prominent. No, I didn't. I didn't no, meet I'm... them. I didn't know them. Um, I knew of Khalil Zad mm -hmm. because he was a very much of a uh, neocon with the Reagan people. He was very part of yeah. that crowd. And I was not... Um, uh, favorably disposed toward the Reagan and the Reagan crowd, you know, so I was, I didn't have a good impression of him from that. So what? Uh, what Hayubi's what? a good guy. I've, I've met him. I like him. He's he's a nice guy, but, you know, I don't know what the, I don't have an opinion of the political, <laughs> what they did. <laughs> they, they, they pretty much, you know, they, they screwed up, but they, they were not alone in screwing, screwing things up. They on, 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 on that. Um, yeah. You know, after the uh, the the coalition's invasion or involvement in Afghanistan, you know, a vast opportunity opened up for a lot of people uh, to, I suppose, to get their share of the largesse that had been, you know, ha was pouring on Afghanistan. Did didn't you have the opportunity to go to Afghanistan and become something? You know, use your 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 expertise in Afghanistan become you know, become a public figure in Afghanistan. Didn't you have that or didn't you want to do that? I did not want to do that <clears throat> um, because, you know, at that point I'm 50 years old and I have very much of a life. I'm very seated in the life I live. I have friends. I have, you know, I have things I do. I have a house, blah, blah, blah. I'm here. I wasn't, my father died long ago and many of my relatives have come out. So I was not, inclined to move back to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, because remember, I have nostalgia and I love Afghanistan, but I also love America and my American self. And I'm that guy mm -hmm. very much. So I'm not, you know, I, I'm not favorably disposed to, to people who say things about me as an American guy in a way that I feel disrespects my mother. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, my mother was a very, uh, impressive person. I love her. She's gone now, but uh, I'm both guys. So, but, you know, but yeah, I could have gone back to Afghanistan. Uh, you may have seen, I think I did mention in Games Without Rules, that uh, I was solicited to go back as a translator. You know, and okay. people, the, you know, there were private companies that were calling me out of the blue and saying, Mr. Ansari, we'd like to offer you a job going to Afghanistan and being a translator. And I was like, no, you don't want me. I speak Farsi, but I don't speak Pashto. That's what you need. Yeah. And this this idiot on the phone said, your Pashto is good enough. And <laughs> said, you, you don't even know me. <laughs> so I they, suppose that said, is that is the level of, you know, the level of understanding of Afghanistan. They had, I've been reading uh, the, um, the, the Afghanistan papers by Craig Whitlock. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's it's an I incredible. I just recently heard about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's an incredible expose of, uh, you know, what America got long, wrong in Afghanistan. And I was, uh, in in one of the previous episodes, I've interviewed you know British diplomats and politicians. So one of the guys I, uh, I uh, interviewed you know two episodes ago, uh, Tobias Elwood, who was you know one of the most senior British politicians, and he's. He was the chair of the British Parliament's uh, Defence Select Committee, uh, which the equivalent would be, you know, the Congress is the Senate uh, Armed Services Committee, I suppose. Yeah. Um, OK. And 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 he, you know, he's his idea was, look, um, we we and, and the British diplomats that I've spoken to. So we, we didn't understand Afghanistan. You know, we've had a long history with them. But we quite didn't go back to read our own history books uh, with yeah. we use that experience, let alone the Americans. So it was a sense of, you know, America uh, after 9-11, um, 
you know whatever happened not whatever happened what happened in, uh, you know in 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 911 made america angry enough to play that bull in the china shop i suppose yeah yeah and it's just well, without understanding what was going on and what the history of the country was about well yeah but i think america fell into a uh, a trap that great powers often do mm -hmm. uh they think that military prowess uh can do things that it can't do <laughs> mm. you know and i think it was uh, it was um uh part of the trap for afghan uh, for americans was that they assumed that once they were able to um provide material abundance mm. afghans would would come aboard they would say oh yeah okay we love this um and what they you know what i've been groping my way towards being able to say now recently is what they didn't know how to do was to create was to enable afghans to have an afghanistan where they felt at home mm. uh they couldn't create that in Afghanistan because they didn't know what that sense of home was about <laughs> for Afghans. Yeah. Afghans don't know. You know, Afghans, that's something each group of people have to figure out for themselves. And Afghans have not been in a position to be able to grapple with that because the Soviets had that same idea. It's like, yeah, they'll fight us now. Let's just torture the ones that are protesting and kill the ones that won't stop, won't shut up. And meanwhile, just build electric uh, stations and put roads in and get the trade going so that everybody will have food and shelter and warmth and then everybody will love us. That didn't happen. Um, and that didn't, and you know, in their own way, Americans thought that same thing. Once we get everything going and the material abundance is there, people will love us. And when I went in 2012, everybody I talked to secretly didn't love the Americans. That's what I heard. Mm. You know, it's like uh, I I talked to people who were part of the American project. They were officials in some place. You know, they they were running some aspect of the thing. But when I talked to them, they said things like this. They said, yeah, you know, there aren't really any Taliban. When they go out, when you hear about things being blown up or, you know, the Taliban doing something, that's actually the Americans that are doing that. They just want to blow something up and say the Taliban did it so that they'll have an excuse to put their there are soldiers there. And I was like, that's actually not true because I know people who have come here as translators <laughs> and they've gone there and they've seen these things happen. Um, other people, you know, somebody showed me a gun. They were a police person. And they said, yeah, this is what they've given us. Look at this thing. Uh, and he gave it to me. It was like this gun that was made of some very lightweight material and it was like plastic, you know. Mm. I have since learned that yeah, the most sophisticated weapons are made of some plastic kind of thing. Um, and he said, this is actually some technical device that they, they have a chip in it or something. And when they want to from a office in DC, they can turn it off so that none of the guns will work. So when they come for us, uh, all of our guns that they've given <laughs> us, they won't work. He, did, he didn't mention these, Bill Gates, did he? <laughs> he didn't mention, but... <laughs> <laughs> But these are sort of bizarre conspiracy theories, and they all indicate to me that uh, nobody was, a, you know, it's like everybody was ready for this thing to fail. Mm. And they were already thinking about what they were going to do when it failed. Where were they going to run? And how was those incredibly painful days for anyone who, who loved Afghanistan, who, in, who who's interested in Afghanistan, who could care about it? How were those those days for you, August 2021? Um, you know, weirdly enough, I didn't think it was going to happen at that point. Mm. You know, I thought we were looking at another uh, civil war of the 1990s uh, because I thought Kabul was so huge and so populated by people who were in too deep now with the westernizing 
industrialized project, the secular mm -hmm. project, that they weren't going to let these these um, uh, rural Taliban take over the city. You know, I I said, how is you know when they come in, there'll be like ten thousand Taliban in a city of six million people who hate them. They're never going to mm. get anywhere. But then you know, Kunduz fell and. You know, Herat fell, and then Lashkar Gaon fell, and then Qaduz fell, and then Jalalabad. Holy moly. And then, and then those last days happened with the, uh, with the carriers pulling it out. And then I realized I had said this is how it's going to end 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why didn't I realize that? So, um, so it was, uh, it was shock and and sort of sort of despair, but not exactly despair because I was already so skeptical of this project mm -hmm. all along that I just didn't think it was gonna, you know. Not, and I also knew what many Americans didn't know, which was that there was a, a war going on right then. You know, mm -hmm. it's like uh, throughout this time. Uh, outside of the big cities, there was war, and mm -hmm. it was being it was being carried out by drones largely, so that many people didn't have to even notice that there was a war happening, and that those drones were hitting villages, they were hitting rural areas, and that you know America did not have a a draft anymore, so it wasn't just every average American citizen who was in the army fighting in Afghanistan, there was a poverty draft. You know, the people who went into the military here are people who need money. And that's a, a sure fire. You can get in the army and start mm -hmm. being taken care of. And a lot of them were rural poor from America. So it was like out in Afghanistan, the rural poor of America were fighting the rural poor of Afghanistan. And meanwhile, you know, the, uh, the money bags in America and the money bags in Afghanistan were in collusion. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it didn't look like a healthy situation to me. You know? So all of that was mixed into the August event. Um, and, you know, so the Taliban came back. They, they, they retook the whole thing. And then the full-on assault on women began. And yeah. you know, over 60 anti-women decrees have been issued. Now, yeah. were you surprised at what they did? And were you also surprised as to how quickly they managed to roll back all the gains that Afghanistan had gained over the last two decades? Yeah, I was surprised that it happened so quickly and that they, and that they succeeded so quickly. Uh, and I think that the succeeded so quickly part Mm. Uh, comes from 40 years of war weariness. You know, I think what is true in Afghanistan now from everything that I can pick up is that there actually is basically not so much of a war going on. It's not that the war has stopped, you know, mm. but there's much less of a war going on now than there was then. Uh, and, um, and I think people are very reluctant to be back in the situation they were in in the pre-Taliban 90s, mm. you know, when the civil war was happening in the cities. Um, so that's what I'm I'm guessing. But there is also, you know, the the anti, you know, the the shutting down of everything that has to do with the lives of women in Afghanistan. Which is this? Which is this vain effort to not have the modern world happen? Mm. <laughs> you know, which is this vain effort to have the world that existed, let's say, five hundred years ago. Yeah. Uh, and that's Afghanistan is an intense arena where that's happening, but that battle to get the women out of public life and disempower women is happening all over the world. It's happening and you know, that's an issue here in America too. And I'm sure it's happening in 
You know, that's not that's not an isolated thing that's happening in Afghanistan. That's but part of in Afghanistan, world. it's been a long running ancient campaign to keep yeah. women bottled in, you know, one way or another. I mean, you know, earlier yeah. we mentioned, you know, Amanullah Khan, the, the king Amanullah Khan. He tried yeah. it. And uh, and then, you know, it came to a point where everything quietened down until your generation, where your sister went to school with, you know, with, with her face unveiled, which was a big thing considering the environment that you're in. Now, there has been yeah. a persistent, uh, I suppose, campaign of suppressing women or keep them suppressed in Afghanistan, yeah. which has not really stopped. And the Taliban are just, uh, you know, another manifestation of that but i just wanted to pick your brain on when the taliban i want to say one thing i want to just yeah, stop yeah. and say one thing about the taliban mm. which is uh you know many of the taliban uh of of the afghan taliban because there's also you know there's the arab internationalist yes islamist yeah. thing that's in mm. and so that's a that's a separate thing of its own which is a terrible thing i want yeah, i want to yeah. Call that a separate issue, but the Taliban that are from the Kandahar Shura, that, that yeah. group out of the refugee camps, you know, that war crime of the Soviets that I talked about was their attempt to uh, beat back Afghanistan by destroying rural Afghanistan, and they deliberately tried to uh, create a huge refugee population by bombing those villages, and then they tried to cripple the ability of Afghans to fight back. By littering the landscape with toys that look with landmines that looked like toys, so that they would deliberately cripple children, and those crippled children then grew up in those in those camps, and so there is a there is a generation of forty to fifty year olds who have some very you know we all have some faint memory of that that were built into us when we were little children, and so those guys were born in villages. That kind of was the old way that the villages were and they worked, you know, and they have some memory of some golden age, which for them was the life in the village when they were like two, three, four, five years old. Mm -hmm. And they think, they think there was a golden age there. And they think it had to do with Islam. Mm. And they think that if they could just put back the Islam they've heard about, you know, that the Arab Islamists told them, blah, blah, blah. blah a, a key the, somehow the key part of which was lock up the women <laughs> mm. you know don't let the women out they think they're going to bring back that time that they that is a mythical memory in their deepest psyche they're absolutely wrong about that of course you know mm -hmm. what they're doing is creating the ingredients for another whole generation of terrible a oppression and then after that or accompanying it more violence so you know but the sources of it go back to these crimes that occurred in the childhood of these of these taliban now you, so, you've written you, you've written a book on the history of islam as well but you yeah. know when you when you talk about concepts of human rights the rights of women and international organizations you when you want you know, the international community to act, the expectation is the West, because there's a certain level of, you know, expectation in terms of human rights standards from the West. But why isn't that, you know, why has there not been a debunking of the Taliban's, you know, attitudes to governing, and specifically on women, for example, from the Muslim world? I mean, you know, they've been entirely absent if we are to argue what the Taliban are doing is an Islamic, why hasn't there been an, a, a concerted Islamic debunking of the Taliban's ideology? Because I think a part of it, anyhow, is because over the last couple of hundred years, you know, maybe 300 years, if you extend that out, uh, Islam has sort of been absorbed in anti-imperialism. Mm. So the distinction between those two things has gotten fuzzy. Yeah. And there was a different kind of, you know, Islam was in a different state when it ruled its domains. 
Mm. And then something happened and the West came and somehow the West ended up as the ruler of all Islamic domains, you know. Uh, and they did it in the in in that certain way where they didn't necessarily actually just put plant their king on the Islamic country and then trash it and take the territory. They put some Muslim in the chair and said, you're the boss of this area, just do what we tell you. And so that happened in all these different countries. And the... Uh, the political movement to uh, to uh, uh, you know go against imperialism um, was was able to find grounds in Islam because mm. unlike uh, say Christianity or Buddhism or you know uh, some other religions those those religions anyhow Islam is political at its core. At its source, mm. you know, uh, Christianity, its basic thing is you're an individual soul, you're sinning and you could be saved by accepting Christ as your savior and then blah, blah, blah. Whereas when you go to Islam, the the basic thing is here's how to have a harmonious community. That's what God wants uh, communities on earth to look like. So that's already not just you as an individual. That's how that's about a community. And how a community should run, and the the founding uh, miracle of Islam, so to speak, uh, well, it, it's 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 right there in the fact that the Islamic calendar doesn't begin with, um, you know, uh, Hazrat Muhammad went in a cave and an uh, angel came to. That's not the year zero. Hmm. <laughs> uh, it's not that Muhammad died in, uh, in such and such a year. That's you know that's for for uh, for. Uh, uh, you know, for Christians, the, the the death of Christ was a big moment, but for for Muslims, that's not the big moment. Nor is the birth. It's when they went from Mecca to Medina. Why? Why is that the the year zero? Why is that when it all began? Because that's the moment when Islam could be the blueprint for how a community is operating. And then what happened? Ooh, that community, little tiny. Medina and, and Saudi Arabia within one generation that had an empire bigger than Rome ever was. How could that not be a miracle? So that is right there in the origin story of Islam. So when when anti-imperialism, anti-imperialist energies uh, arose within the Islamic world and they were directed against who, who did have the power, which was Western civilization, Western culture, uh, they harnessed Islam to that and they made it be about culture. You know, so, um, you know, Jamal uh, uh, Afghan <laughs> is one of us, I guess. <laughs> you know, he was like the, <laughs> he's like the kind of the inventor of Islamism. And his big thing was, you know, his, his founding proposition was the world actually consists of two entities that are at war with one another and one is Islam and one is the West. That's basically what he said. Mm. And then, you know, the other thing he basically said was, and the West is powerful because they embrace technology and we didn't. And we could embrace technology because we were the original, you know, uh, people who were, you know, we were the original religion who embraced science. We could mm. have science. What we have to do is reject culture. And then the you know other Muslims following in his footsteps said, Yeah, and reject culture means let's not have this thing where women have power. Let's let's that became the very essence of of uh, you know what Islamism in terms of culture ended up being about. It's like, no, don't let the women in public life, keep them in the house. Um and I heard that all over the Muslim world that I traveled in in 19, whenever it was, 79, I think it was, 80. Uh, you know, I went to North Africa and I went to uh, Turkey. I couldn't get into Iran. The uh, Soviets had just invaded. So that was, you know, that, that shut me off. But everywhere I went, that's what people were saying. Mm. Uh, you know, they were saying, along with a couple of other Muslim things, you know, everybody was like, oh, there's only one God, not three, not 12. 
that was the thing they cared about. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, dude, I, I'm with you, one God. Um, but then the other thing we're saying is God made uh, women to be in the women's world and men to be in the men's world, and never should those two things be mixed. And that was what a lot of people just focused right in on. Mm. So, and and then recently, if I may just put a, another thought in the hamper, you know, uh, Afghanistan has had this peculiar situation. Uh, it's right amongst all of these big cultures. So if anybody who lives in Afghanistan is doomed to uh, diversity. Mm. You know, everybody and their uncle is going to come through your backyard with their armies, their traders, their ideas, their whatever. But on the other hand, it's this mountainous place where people only know, you know, over the course of centuries, people just know the people that are in the same valley. Mm. Um, so there is the the landscape makes you turn inward and you know it's us guys versus all of them guys out there and then there's a lot of them guys coming through all the time so how do you have both diversity and monoculturalism how do you do mm. that and what afghanistan came up with is it's just a way of life i don't know how it was for you but when i was a kid growing up everybody lived in a compound with high walls that hid the private life from the public life. Mm. Those two things were kept separate. And that was how the society was able to have all these little cultures. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now, all given, these groups. given where we are now, um, yeah. you know, the manner in which the Taliban are going about their business, um, and of course, the regional geopolitics has completely messed up at the moment not um so how, how do you see i mean is do, do you see the taliban's rule sustainable how do you you know you had a crystal ball after not you know when you wrote that letter you you predicted what would happen so what is your prediction now given all that experience of studying afghanistan and looking at it you know i have this uh, this uh, sense of mm. what might happen, uh, which is a, which is not a pretty picture, uh, mm. you know, and it's not the Taliban that I'm concerned about. Uh, I see signs that there is a struggle going on within the ranks of those who have taken over, mm -hmm. and that the other contender is the Hakonis. Yeah, you know the, the mafia uh, tribal network from the uh, uh, border area with Pakistan and the northwest frontier province, whatever that area is. And those guys have been, you know, on the one hand, some of the most ruthless. Most they don't know a limit when it comes to what they might do to get their way, no matter what it involves. You know, so a lot of these terrorist episodes that happened during the American project and you know in Kabul the, the Serena Hotel the you know the intercontinental uh, attack on that hotel and so on these were a, a lot of them were carried out by the Akonis uh, beheadings video beheadings um, you know ch child children trained to be uh, bombed. suicide bombers yeah, suicide bombers, all of that stuff. These have colonies have been hip deep in this, um, and um, and what occurred to me the other day was, um, you know, along with that, unlike the the Taliban, the Kandahar Shura, those those Taliban, these guys are sophisticated modernists in mm. terms of technology and. You know, banking and, you know, uh, they, when you're part of an international crime network like they are. Yeah, yeah. You have the sophistication to operate in a world where the other players are the government of UK and the government of France. They have that kind of skill. I don't know if these, I think these, these, these other, these really, the Taliban from the camps, those guys, I think, are not sophisticated 
So I think if these guys take over, uh, they could be a, a government. And I realize, you know, Abdurrahman was one of these kinds of guys. You know, it's like we we think of them as, oh, these guys are, they can't govern a country. They're like mobsters. Mobsters can't. Mobsters are, are governing countries in a lot of places. Putin's crowd is a mobster crowd, mm. you know. Um, and if they were to emerge as the dynasty that rules Afghanistan, and if the world was going to be quiet and, you know, everything was just going to be somehow restore some stability and peace, two generations, their children, their grandchildren are going to be going to universities and, you know, be musicians and artists because that's how ruling cliques emerge. They all come from some original swamp of terrifying mobsters who will stop at nothing. So <laughs> yeah, there's also a, a thing. Part, there's also a part of what I fear. There, there's also a thing about you know the great neighbor next door, Pakistan. Um, yeah, you, know, you you you've mentioned them in your writings as well because. Afghan rulers, you know, going back decades, have have got a default position when goings get tough in order to mobilize their base, the Pashtun base, I say, they turn yeah. into that default position of anti-Pakistanism. You know, yeah. it happened with Dawood because he was the arch anti-Pakistani. And then it happened with other leaders and rulers, uh, apart from Mullah Omar, because, you know, he was there you know, in a sense, they're their man. But, you know, in their dying days of Afghan rulers, they all turn, turn against Pakistan. We see a similar attitude by some Taliban leaders, you know, talking yeah. about we don't recognize the deer online, we, we don't have a we don't have a, an, an official border with Pakistan and things like that. So, you know, do, how do you see that dynamic play out? Well, some of that I see as, you know, some of the things that have been said between these ISI and Afghanis, uh, I look at the signals from the Afghanis that, yeah, we were your, you know, you thought we were your puppets in Afghanistan, but actually we were using you and now we're sovereign country and they're not obeying you anymore. Uh, there was some exchange where the uh, ISI told the uh, Afghanis, you guys, uh, you know, rein in the, the Taliban, Tariq the Taliban that are in Pakistan, Pakistan. or the Right, and they said, no, we don't, uh, we're actually friends with them and we're not, you know, they're, you're our allies, but they're our allies too. It's like, wait, <laughs> your allies include the guys that are planting bombs in our offices? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it was like right after that, that the uh, that Pakistan said, okay, 2.4 million uh, Afghan refugees have to go back to Afghanistan right now. And that was them saying, Oh yeah, you're not our puppets. How about this? So I think there's something going on there between these two forces. Uh, it's interesting that you know that order to send the refugees back received no hardly any notice in the global press because mm. other terrible things are going on. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Uh, but then the the other uh, future of Afghanistan. Uh, Thing that I want to say, which is imponderable at this point, but it looks to me like, man, China is really lining up to be the next next batter in Afghanistan. It was like, mm. oh, somebody wants to, uh, you know, Afghanistan is open to imperialists. Hey, uh, I, I'd like to be an imperialist. Um, and so China is very, seems very active there, you know, and, and the Chinese way of doing it is to offer aid until the country is completely in your debt and then just own it. And that's, after the, that's, they their, own it that, that's their thing. You know, China's been debt trapping third world <laughs> countries for, you know, as part of their large foreign investment projects. You know, that's right. Quite, and they, Afghanistan is a linchpin in that. Hmm. You know, they've got that Belt and Road thing. And so the, the, the there's that network of roads north of Afghanistan, and they've got that yeah. ocean thing south of Afghanistan. If they get Afghanistan, that whole thing comes together. And they are buying carpets, they're buying pine nuts, they're, you know, aiding uh, solar. They've got some solar projects in Herat that they're 
helping. They're doing a lot of, they're pouring a lot of money into Afghanistan. They're going to build a road, I heard, and mm. from, uh, you know, from Wuhan through the Wuhan corridor from yeah. China down, down into Kabul. Um, so I, I think that's another thing to watch. But of course, that depends on what happens with China, uh, Russia, mm. uh, Israel, Gaza. And then America. So there's a lot of players lining up for that. So what are what what are your your hopes for Afghanistan? You know, for all the things I've said about the uh, the royal monarchy mm. of my day that got uh, crushed and now they're almost forgotten. I feel like. They did do some some correct things, you know. They were trying to uh, bring the country into the modern age. They were trying to do it without, uh, you know. They were trying to find a way to to get the to solve this women's issue in Afghanistan uh, in a way that was gradualist enough to let it happen. You know, I'm on the law. They knew he went too fast, so they were. They were going the this, this slower way, but they they couldn't they couldn't do it. Uh, I would like to see Afghans have at least enough peace, internal peace, to start working on uh, building a society that is viable in the new age that's coming. I think uh, there is a problem that's coming that's global. And so Afghanistan is not just isolate, you know, it's, it's not an isolated situation. Afghanistan can't just solve its own problem and the hell with everything else. Because I think we have two generations left unless we do something, you know, mm. globally, all of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that one thing that requires is for us to have, in addition to all our individual cultures that we feel at home in and we're with, we have to have also a global culture, something mm. that is a framework all of us fit within and which we can all speak that language and talk to one another as fellow humans, <laughs> you know. And so Afghanistan is, is going to have to build a culture that fits into a global culture just as much as America is going to have to. We don't have that global culture right now. Right now, you know, I'm much more pointed towards what's going to happen in America, because I think within the next year, there's a very crucial election that's going to determine which way it goes. Mm. And I want to make sure that in America, we don't lose the ability to have the good things about modernization that exclude fascism and you know Christian nationalism, which is the mess yeah. in my country right now, right here where I am. Uh, I feel like Afghanistan, if it could find a way, oh man, it's got to find a way to move out of that uh, that divided realm idea of how to organize a society where there's a men's world and a women's world and there the twain shall meet and the men are in charge of everything public and the women are only the, the mistresses of home and children. They, that belongs to some distant day in the past that is not coming back. But Afghanistan has the, the makings of being a peaceful and important piece of the world uh, that it never had before, because always before, one of its essential characteristics was it was remote. <laughs> mm. That is not going to be the case now because no place is going to be remote. And Afghanistan is no exception to that. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'll be brief about this, but when I was there in 2012, you know, and I, uh, I could tell as soon as I landed in Kabul, oh, this is not remote. You know, this is like, this just feels like New York, just mm -hmm. one year, but it's Istanbul, New York, Paris. These are all like international cities. People say, well, you have to get out of the city then. So we went to Bamyan, and then we went from Bamyan. We went, we were trying to get to Valley of the Dragon, you know. Mm -hmm. And we drove, and there was no, there was no road anymore. And we were just like 
no place. And then I look up and there's a little village up there. And I see a little white line. I get a binocular. What the hell is that? And it's a, it's a, a satellite it was dish. A satellite dish, yeah. Mm. And I'm like, a satellite dish here? Where? What do they? How do they power it? They said, oh, they have solar panels. Mm. All these little villages have solar panels. But what do they get here? Oh, they can get Kabul. They can get uh, Pakistan. They can get uh, Afghan Star. They're listening to Afghan Star. There. You know, well, how do they pay for it? Opium. <laughs> you know about that. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so uh, uh, Afghanistan is going to be part of the same. And plus, there's this diaspora now, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that the roots of the culture of the diaspora, all of us, you included, uh, our roots go back to a world that was struggling with the central problem of humanity for centuries. How do you how do you reconcile the diversity and and monoculturalism? Everybody needs to have a space where they can be with their own people and they feel at home. None of us can feel at home with everyone on earth. That's just not a possibility. But we have to also have a culture we all authentically from the heart belong to that we share with all humans. And we know that that culture has to have some way in which it includes everybody. Everybody has an equal share, you know, equal membership. Nobody has lower status to somebody else. And it has to be open to all the different cultures on earth. Uh, Afghanistan has some experience there. The diversity, I mean, the uh, the diaspora has roots in that cult, in the culture that was struggling with that problem for centuries. We have something vital to add to the conversation that's happening right now. So that, that's what I want to say. <laughs> to oh, thank you us. so much. It's, it's, been, it's been fascinating, enlightening, your experience. Uh, your story is just an incredible one. Uh, it, it's an, it, your story is just an incredible one. Now, thank you ever so much. I'm really, really grateful for your time. Uh, on that, well, note. thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me to be on your podcast, uh, 